Now, before we get to the message today, remember Pastor Mark said last week, you are not to take his word for it. Well, I've been a pastor for 40 years, so you can take my word for it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he also said numerous times um, he was not infallible. Uh, neither am I, but I'm about as close as you'll get. So. <laughs> And before you start going to your devices to say, I want to text Pastor Mark, he already knew I was going to do this. So we <laughs> talked about it when I, uh, when I take the teaser and I said, I was thinking about that. And he said, yeah, you should do that. So, uh, so he knew what I was going to say. But as we think about uh, our topic today, do you sometimes find yourself facing a seemingly impossible situation? And you think about it and try to figure out how you're going to do, and two words come to your mind. That's impossible. We cannot figure out a way to get through that. It might be a relationship that seems to be broken down. It might be an issue with health, finances, the pandemic, or something else where change seems impossible. In fact, when I was in high school, it's when I received my call to ministry. And I'd like to say, oh, I had it all made, but I did not like doing this kind of thing when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And to tell you a story, I, I grew up in church from little on up, sixth grade, we were doing Children's Day. That was a big thing in, in the churches there. They always had a Children's Day, everybody had a part. And I was supposed to lead the Lord's Prayer. And I stood there, because I forgot how it started. <laughs> Until finally the teacher realized something was a mess and started. And I'm like, oh yeah, I got it right there. But yeah, I was not uh, thinking anything along that line. But the Lord was and showed how the impossible can be made possible. That I stand before you even now. And I know most people don't believe it once they got to know me. And I passed it for years, but uh, it was true there. With God, there is always hope, no matter how bad things look. So I'd like to read uh, the scripture, Matthew 19, starting at verse 23. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, then who can be saved? And looking upon them, Jesus said to them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Then Peter answered and said to him, behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake shall receive many times as much and shall inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Nothing is impossible with God. His power makes all things Possible. Now, some of you might recognize this name, some of you might say, who? But Norman Vincent Peale, he was a great Christian leader, as they say, back in the day. <laughs> uh, and he wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. And as I was looking at this, uh, I noticed for about three and a half years, it was the number one bestseller uh, in, a, in America. And it showed how much that was. But we're talking about more here than po the power of positive thinking. Because that would mean somehow we could maybe, if I just think positively enough, I can get through it. But it's really about the power of God that makes what seems impossible, possible. As he said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now before this passage, there was a rich young ruler that came to Jesus, and he asked, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain 
eternal life. And so Jesus told them you needed to keep the commandments and uh, do what they say. And the young man replied, well, I did that. What am I still lacking? And Jesus then said, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Well, once he heard that, his response wasn't so positive then. It says, he went away grieved, for he was one who owned much property. Or another version says, he was holding on tight to a lot of things, and he couldn't bear to let go. Does that sound at all familiar? We don't hold on to anything, do we? No. no. And it isn't just it isn't just material things or possessions. There can be attitudes we hold on to. There can be uh, other things in our lives that we hold on to. Think about the different things we hold on to that keep us from following Him. And then we come to our passage because then Jesus spoke to his disciples and he said it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven hard because of his possessions position vocation self-centeredness sin there are a lot of different reasons why it's hard not just for a rich man but for any person to come to christ but notice jesus didn't say it was impossible for him to come to that in fact this is just a comparison that he talks about to express the idea of the impossible when he says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, just so you know, a needle is something you use to repair clothing. I know now we usually just pitch it and go get something new, but it is something that was used. And you find out as the years go by that that eye of the needle gets smaller and smaller. Yeah. I had a lot of people agreeing with me uh, at the first service because, yeah, it has to do with our sight. But you know how small the eye of a needle is. We know how big a camel is. There, there doesn't seem to be anything possible there. So that's what he was trying to say. It's not possible, humanly speaking, uh, but it can be through God. In fact, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that we are to remove the log out of our eye before we can see the splinter in another person's eye. Now again, we don't, you know, nobody I don't think ever had a log. They might have had a, a splinter. They might have got something there. But the fact was, it's trying to say you need to move, remove the things that are blocking your vision before you try to start seeing a little something in your neighbor's eye. But he uses these kinds of examples to illustrate what's going on. And, uh, because it's poss it is impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, humanly impossible. But Jesus concedes for God with whom nothing is impossible can even save a rich man. He can even save each one of us. It's not easy for anyone to enter the kingdom of God because Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. We know the way that's broad and out there, well, that's the way of the world. That's open there. We see it all the time. But we need to look for that way of the Lord because it is small and, or the gate is small and the way is narrow. But just so you know, as we look in the New Testament, there were some other rich men who did actually come to know the Lord. Remember singing about that wee little man and when you were in Sunday school, Zacchaeus? Yeah. Yeah, he had plenty of money. He was a tax collector. But when the Lord came to his home, he gave much of that away. He said, if I have defrauded anybody, I'll do this. I'll make sure they didn't pay more than they needed to, all this kind of thing. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea, he was the one who helped to bury Jesus after his death on the cross. And he was a wealthy man. He was part of the, the ruling elders of the day there. And another man that Jesus met, we only read about him in the Gospel of John, but Nicodemus, because the Gospel of John says he helped Joseph. So it shows they can come, and we know that's true. We may even know some people who, you know, to us seem well off or whatever, and yet we know they're committed to the Lord and they're following him. So it's not always about what's going on, but what the Lord is doing in our hearts. Because then the disciples ask, then who can be saved? Almost sounds like 
well, that's impossible if you're telling me, you know, a camel through the eye of a needle or something like that. And so Jesus then responds there in verse 26, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And, uh, and so uh, another version says, there are some things that people cannot do, but God can do anything. And it is impossible for anyone at all to be saved apart from God's grace and power. And that's where it all comes in. It's not up to us, but it's up to him. And uh, we need to accept that invitation. But he gives us, the, uh, through his grace and power, can we come to him. Luke 18, 27 says, The things impossible with men are possible with God. So it's not about us. It's about God. God sees the way through the impossible, even when we do not. And it is up to us to trust him. If we go back to the Christmas story, you'll remember that the angel Gabriel came to Mary to talk to her about the role she was to play. And of course she had a few questions <laughs> and uh, he shared with her about her relative Elizabeth, who was older, wasn't expected to have any children. She was now expecting a son and all that. And then said, for nothing will be impossible with God. This should be our statement of faith that we are reminded even when we're going through the trials and the difficulty nothing will be impossible with God listen to these words and I'm sure while you may have not known the Norman Vincent Peale reference you might know this reference because I heard it on the radio while I was preparing this message and uh, I thought, well, these words are wonderful. It's called Nothing's Impossible With You from the group I Am They. Uh, and so it says, right now I'm staring down a giant. Right now I can't see past my pain. And right now my songs have turned to silence and you've never seen so far away. But I still believe, I still believe there's no heart you can't rescue, no war you can't win, no story so over it can't start again. No pain you won't use, no wall you won't break through. It might be too much for me, but there is no impossible with you. Right now you're fighting all my battles. Right now you're breathing life again. And I know you're mighty in my weakness, so right now my soul will say amen. Your name is greater, your love is stronger, your ways are higher, there's nothing that you can't do because there's no impossible with you. And in fact, we see that in Scripture often. Abraham and Sarah were very old in the book of Genesis, but an angel said, you're going to have a son. While they were having some questions about that, they were basically saying that's impossible. But the angel replied, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Well, it wasn't, because they had the son Isaac, and uh, we know that's where all of God's people came from eventually, Isaac on to Jacob and, uh, and beyond uh, to that. And so uh, it was there. Or think about when they were fleeing from Egypt, and there was the Red Sea in front of them, an Egyptian army behind them, what were they to do? Well, God took care of that. The parting of the Red Sea, and they crossed over and uh, were safe. Then they crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land, again, where he had to stop the water that they could get through. And it was the fall of Jericho. They didn't have a great battle. They didn't have the best weapons. God told them to just march around the city for seven days, blow their trumpets, and the wall came tumbling down. Uh, think if you told a military leader today, uh, or military leader says, yeah, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go in, we're going to march around, we're going to do this, and, and it's going to be. Well, we know that's not the strategy. We're usually looking for the biggest and the best weapons, the easiest way to do that. But we know that this was God taking care of this. Gideon and the 300 who defeated a mighty army of Midian it wasn't their ability, it was God's. And David and Goliath, David shouldn't have won that battle, but God
God saw that he did. And think about Jesus' resurrection. Jesus died. That should have been the end of it. But we know that he rose again because of that. We have new life and we have eternal life. In fact, as we think about this, there's some modern day examples that, uh, that I came across and, uh, and we share those. One is a woman saying, Lord, I can't do this. It's impossible. My husband has left after 22 and a half years of marriage, making me a single mom and two sons. I earned a freelancer's income and poor vision prevented, prevented me from driving. Thanks to a loving church family, I had plenty of support, but there were some things friends couldn't do. They couldn't shield me from the overwhelming legal process. They couldn't give me the wisdom and strength to face bankruptcy and foreclosure. They couldn't provide a home. Only the Lord could help me battle depression and move forward with my life, and he did. In scripture, Jesus equipped his followers to do impossible, scary, is this for real things. Another story is from Roberta. Roberta was retiring from her job after 38 years and looking forward to the second act of her life, enjoying it on her terms. And one of the things she needed was a more dependable vehicle. More specifically, a dependable vehicle on a limited budget. And so she prayed to the Lord, Lord, please help me find a low mileage car in great condition for a great price. Something a little old lady has just driven to the post office. Haven't we all said that sometime? Yeah, we'd like something like that. Well, one Saturday morning, her sister said, let's go to an estate sale uh, in another town nearby. She really didn't want to go. She had never been to this town, didn't know what would be, what would be going on, but they made their way there. And uh, the woman had to go into a nursing home. And so the man conducting the sale said to Roberta, I know you're not looking for a car, but if you were, I have an incredible deal out in the garage and the price gets reduced a thousand dollars in 10 minutes. Then he added, up, added words that sent a chill up her spine when she said, hard to believe, but it only has 19,000 miles on it. The woman just drove that baby to the post office. <laughs> Remember her prayer? Something with low mileage, didn't cost a lot. Maybe somebody just drove to the post office. Doesn't the Lord know how to work things out? But it even got better. When she took possession of the car, she looked on the rearview mirror, and there was hanging a placard that said, With God, all things are possible. And so we know how that is. And then there's one other example that, uh, that I came across. Back in 2008, during the NCAA basketball championship, Kansas was playing Memphis, and Memphis was ahead by nine points with a little over two minutes to go, which usually means you're in trouble at that point. The individual that's telling this story said, well, they pretty much gave up hope, but here they started battling back, and with two seconds left, one of their stars hit a three-point shot, tied the game, and in overtime, they went on to win the game. And she said, for fans like me, it was a miracle. Well, a little more than a month later, her husband and she were attending their church's worldwide front quadrennial meeting in Fort Worth, Texas. Someone held up a basketball to make a point. And so the Kansas bishop got an idea. He collected $420 in pledges from the delegation members from Kansas and publicly challenged delegations from Memphis, North Carolina, and Carolina Pacific, these were all teams the Kansas had beaten on the way to the championship to make higher bids. The funds raised were gonna to go to Nothing But Nets, a project that raises money from mosquito nets to protect children in Africa from malaria. Well, those conferences raised the bidding and soon other conferences joined in. In the midst of it, a foundation said they would match the highest bid. <laughs> After six days of spirited bidding, the West Ohio Conference won the auction with a bid of $80,000. So automatically that's gonna be double. But the losers also paid. So the final total 
was 428,000 and just a little more than that, a thousand times more than the original amount that was there and enough to save the lives of nearly 50,000 children. These things seem impossible, but with God, we know that all things are possible in the midst of all that time. So after Jesus spoke these words, Peter then asked, well, you know, we've left everything, we followed you, what, what's there for us? Is there gonna be anything there for us? And, and you know, Peter was sort of impulsive, so he would ask that kind of a, uh, a question. The rest of the disciples might have been thinking it, they probably wouldn't have brought it up to Jesus, but he did. And Jesus reminded them that, you know, in that time when he goes to that glorious throne, they will have 12 thrones that will be there, and everyone who left things behind will receive uh, even much more. Because whatever the cost, it is nothing compared to what it cost Jesus to make eternal life possible for you and for me. And it is nothing compared to the cost of not following Jesus. And it is nothing compared to what we receive when it says there at the end of verse 29, we receive many times as much and shall inherit eternal life. Jesus promises that for everything you give up, you will receive far more and reminds us that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. As I come to the close, I have a quote from Charles Swindoll, and this was actually the quote that got me going on this message. Uh, I, I came across it um, probably two, three months ago, and it says, we are faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. Now this was written years ago, but it certainly was appropriate for our time when we thought about it and uh, think about it. So whatever struggles you are facing at the moment, however difficult life looks, however impossible the situation seems, it is important to remember his love for you and the trust that with God, all things are possible. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for making the impossible possible. We know that you do that time and time again and help us to know it doesn't rely on our strength, our wisdom, our understanding, but it comes in us trusting you because it is through your grace and through your power that all these things can happen. So when we are faced with these impossible situations, may we remember that nothing is impossible with you and that through you, you can make that impossible possible. We pray this all in the name of Christ our Savior.